Welcome to Just Conversations, where we have conversations just like this. Chapter 13. On Probability. Probability is founded on the presumption of a resemblance between those objects of which we have had experience and those of which we have had none. And therefore, it is impossible that this presumption can arise from probability. David Hume, Treaties of Human Nature. The argument up to date shows that miracles are possible, and that there is nothing antecedently ridiculous in the stories which say that God has sometimes performed them. This does not mean, of course, that we are committed to believing all stories of miracles. Most stories about miraculous events are probably false. If it comes to that, most stories about natural events are false. Lies, exaggerations, misunderstandings, and hearsay make up perhaps more than half of all that is said and written in the world. We must therefore find a criterion whereby to judge any particular story of the miraculous. In one sense, of course, our criterion is plain. Those stories are to be accepted for which the historical evidence is sufficiently good. But then, as we saw at the outset, the answer to the question, how much evidence should we require for this story, depends on our answer to the question, how far is this story intrinsically probable? We must therefore find a criterion of probability. The ordinary procedure of the modern historian, even if he admits the possibility of miracle, is to admit no particular instance of it until every possibility of natural explanation has been tried and failed. That is, he will accept the most improbable natural explanations rather than say that a, mir a miracle occurred. Collective hallucination, hyp hypnotism of unconsenting spectators, widespread instantaneous conspiracy and lying by persons not otherwise known to be liars and not likely to gain by the lie, all these are known to be very improbable events. So improbable that, except for the special purpose of excluding a miracle, they are never suggested. But they are preferred to the admission of a miracle. This is a phenomenon that Lewis points out about um, historical analysis of miracles. Uh, historians, um, any, any, uh, any sort of secular or, or um, materialist theologian that you'll hear on a show, uh, all of the explanations for miraculous events or for um, anything supernatural in the Bible uh, as, a, as a possible historical event are discounted from the from the jump and the explanation that's offered is um anything it must be a natural explanation and it no matter how absurd the natural explanation is it's preferred to the miraculous one um there's a preference here for um defaulting to any explanation that is non-religious right that is natural um, that arises from natural causes, not and, and to to um, latch on to any natural explanation that, no matter how absurd it is, is still a natural explanation. That's preferred over a miraculous one. Some of the things he lists here: collective hallucination, hypnotism of unconsenting spectators, widespread instantaneous conspiracy, and lying by persons not otherwise known to be liars and not likely to gain by the lie. These are all offered as possible explanations for what would otherwise be a miracle. Um, but they are preferred uh, by historians or by someone looking into the matter most of the time uh, over the miraculous explanation. He goes on to say, such a procedure is, from the purely historical point of view, sheer midsummer madness, unless we start by knowing that any miracle whatever is more improbable than the most improbable natural event. Do we know this? We must distinguish the different kinds of improbability. Since miracles are, by definition, rarer than other events, it is obviously improbable beforehand that one will occur at any given place and time. In that sense, every miracle is improbable. But that sort of improbability does not make the story that a miracle has happened incredible, for in the same sense, all events, whatever, were once improbable. It is immensely improbable beforehand that a pebble dropped from the stratosphere over London will hit any given spot, or that any one particular person will win a large lottery. 
but the report that a pebble has landed outside such and such a shop, or that Mr. So-and-so has won the lottery, is not at all incredible. When you consider the immense number of meetings and fertile unions between ancestors which were necessary in order that you should be born, you perceive that it was once immensely improbable that such a person as you should come to exist. But once you are here, the report of your existence is not in the least incredible. With probability of this kind, antecedent probability of chances, we are not here concerned. Our business is with historical probability. Ever since Hume's famous essay, which uh, Lewis begins this chapter with, uh, he begins it with a quote from David Hume, ever since Hume's famous essay, it has, been, it has been believed that historical statements about miracles are the most intrinsically improbable of all historical statements. According to Hume, probability rests on what may be called the majority vote of our past experiences. The more often a thing has been known to happen, the more probable it is that it should happen again, and the less often, the less probable. Now, the regularity of nature's course, says Hume, is supported by something better than the majority vote of past experiences. It is supported by their unanimous vote, or, as Hume says, by firm and unalterable experience. There is, in fact, uniform ex experience against miracle. Otherwise, says Hume, it would not be a miracle. A miracle is therefore the most improbable of all events. It is always more probable that the witness, witnesses were lying or mistaken than that a miracle occurred. Now, of course, we must agree with Hume that if there is absolutely uniform experience against miracles, if in other words they have never happened, why then they never happened? Excuse me, why then they never have? Unfortunately, we know the experience against them to be uniform only if we know that all the reports of them are false. And we can know all the reports to be false only if we know already that miracles have never occurred. In fact, we are arguing in a circle. Lewis is going to get to something in this chapter that is lost on most people. It was lost on me before Lewis brought it to my attention that when we're asking, do miracles occur? What we're really asking is, is nature uniform? And we can't assume that nature is uniform in order to answer that question, do miracles occur? Because of the same question. Miracles are, by definition, an interruption of the normal flow of events. Mm -hmm. A breaking with the normal flow of events that um, a miracle is an event that um, if nature was left to itself, it would never have produced. Right? We kind of started out with that definition at the beginning of, of the book. So, to ask, do miracles occur, is the same question, as Lewis goes on to point out here, as the question, is nature completely and utterly uniform? No breaks at all in it. What Hume has done, and what most people do, uh, really ever since, ever since David Hume's essay, is, in order to answer the question, are miracles possible, they begin by assuming the answer to another form of that question, which is, is nature uniform? They say, yes, nature is uniform, and therefore, miracles are not possible. This is the same thing as, um, as uh, um, begging the question, because when we beg the question, we assume the answer to the question before we ever investigate it. So this is what's been done with, with the uniformity of nature. When we're asking, do miracles occur, we're really asking, is nature uniform? And we can't assume the answer to the second one to get the answer to the first one, because of the same question. So this is what Lewis goes on to explain here. There is also an objection to Hume, which leads us deeper into our problem. The whole idea of probability, as Hume understands it, depends on the principle of the uniformity of nature. Unless nature always goes on the same way, the fact that a thing had happened 10 million times would not make it a whit more probable that it would happen again. And how do we know the uniformity of nature? A moment's thought shows that we do not know it by experience. We observe many regularities in nature, but of course all the observations that men have made or will make while the race lasts cover only a minute, excuse me, cover only a minute fraction of the events that actually go on. Even if all human history was recorded in great detail, and it isn't, but even if it was, 
it would cover only a blink in time for how long the universe has been around. So we can't, Lewis is saying, we can't know the uniformity of nature by experience because all of our experience summed up accounts for almost nothing of the amount of time that the universe has been around. Our observations would therefore be of no use unless we felt sure that nature, when we are not watching her, behaves in the same way as when we are. In other words, unless we believed in the uniformity of nature. Experience therefore cannot prove uniformity, because uniformity has to be assumed before experience proves anything. And mere length of experience does not help matters. It is no good saying, each fresh experience confirms our belief in uniformity, and therefore we reasonably expect that it will always be confirmed. For that argument works only on the assumption that the future will resemble the past, which is simply the assumption of uniformity under a new name. Can we say that uniformity is at any rate very probable? Unfortunately not. We have just seen that all probabilities depend on it. Unless nature is uniform, nothing is either probable or improbable. And clearly the assumption which you have to make before there is any such thing as probability cannot itself be probable. The odd thing is that no man knew this better than Hume. His essays on miracles, excuse me, his essay on miracles is quite inconsistent with the more radical and honorable skepticism of his main work. The question, do miracles occur, and the question, is the course of nature absolutely uniform, are the same question asked in two different ways. Hume, by sleight of hand, treats them as two different questions. He first answers yes to the question whether nature is absolutely uniform, and then uses this yes as a ground for answering no to the question, do miracles occur? So you see here, he assumes the answer to the first question in order to get the answer to the second one. But they're the same question. Mm -hmm. So what he's done is actually, this, and this is the great uh, sin of any philosopher, is to beg the question. He's assumed the answer to the question he set out to answer in the first place. That's called begging the question. And uh, uh, Lewis says he, the odd thing is that he, above all people, knew this better than, better than most because Hume is known as a skeptic. He's known as a, um, a skeptical philosopher. He rigorously wants to question everything. But the thing he leaves out when he goes on this quest to question everything is his own assumptions. He leaves those out as something that doesn't need to be questioned in this matter. The single real question which he set out to answer is never discussed at all. He gets the answer to one form of the question by assuming the answer to another form of the same question. Probabilities of this kind that Hume is concerned with hold inside the framework of an assumed uniformity of nature. So Hume is standing inside of a circle um, or a house, or th that's good, he's standing inside of a house, a, fra a framework of a house, and inside that framework of his house, he, his assumptions work, but only um, if that, only if that uh, uh, framework is true, right? Outside of that framework, he has no guarantee that any of his assumptions are true, as Lewis goes on to explain here. Probabilities of this of the kind that Hume is concerned with hold inside the framework of an assumed uniformity of nature. The question, when the question of miracles is raised, we are asking about the validity or perfection of the frame itself. No study of probabilities inside a given frame can ever tell us how probable it is that the frame itself can be violated. Granted a school timetable with French on Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock, it is really probable that Jones, who always skips his French preparation, will be in trouble next Tuesday, and that he was in trouble on any previous Tuesday. But what does this tell us about the probability of the timetables being altered? This, this is a terrific analogy here, because when we're, Hume stands inside of nature and says, nature is uniform, and therefore miracles can't occur. But when we're asking about whether miracles are probable or improbable, or whether they can occur at all, we're not asking we're asking a larger question, a question outside of nature. He's standing inside of nature and say, look, nature is uniform. We can't, uh, therefore miracles can't occur. But when we're asking about miracles, what we're asking is, is the framework itself something we can depend on? He's appealing to the framework and we're asking a larger question, a question above that. We're asking, is the framework indeed 
uniform. He's pointing to its uniformity and saying, look, it's uniform. And we're saying, or, or he, he's saying the, 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 uh, the framework is uniform and therefore miracles can't occur. And we're saying, mir asking the question about miracles asks a question that is above the uniformity of nature altogether. It's asking, is the framework you're using even a thing? It's a deeper question. And Lewis uses this really nice analogy here. He says, you know, you look at a, you look at a school timetable, uh, uh, a list of the classes and the times that, that they occur during the day. And here's French that's supposed to occur at this time on a Tuesday. Now, given, what you, given that you know that it's going to occur at, a French class is going to occur at this time on a Tuesday, this person named Jones is probably going to be in trouble on Tuesday because you know that he always skimps on his French preparation. He doesn't ever do his homework. So probably the probability that he will be in trouble on Tuesday and the probability he's been in trouble on any given Tuesday in the past and the probability that he'll be in trouble on any given Tuesday in the future is pretty high because he doesn't do his work. And the timetable says French is going to be on Tuesday at this time. He goes on to say, to find, uh, he says, um, but what does this tell us about the probability of the timetable being altered? So you, uh, you see, this is what... Hume is doing. Hume's pointing at the timetable and saying, look, French happens on Tuesday. Miracles asks a bigger question. Can the timetable be altered? Can the schedule of classes be altered? Lewis says, but what does this tell us about the probability of the timetables being altered? To find that out, you must eavesdrop in the master's common room. It is no use studying the timetable. We can't tell whether the timetable is going to be altered by studying the timetable. For that, we'd need to have our ear in the principal's or the, the headmaster's common room, because that's where it altered, right? Mm -hmm. If we stick to Hume's method, far from getting what we hoped, namely the conclusion that all miracles are infinitely improbable, we get a complete deadlock. The only kind of probability he allows holds exclusively within the frame of uniformity. When uniformity is itself in question, and it is in question the moment we ask whether miracles occur, this kind of probability is suspended, and Hume knows no other. By his method, therefore, we cannot say that uniformity is either probable or improbable, and equally, we cannot say that miracles are either probable or improbable. We have impounded both uniformity and miracles in a sort of limbo where probability and improbability can never come. This result is equally disastrous for the scientist and the theologian, but along Hume's lines, there is nothing whatever to be done about it. Our only hope, then, will be to cast about for some quite different kind of probability. Let us for the moment cease to ask what right we have to believe in the uniformity of nature and ask why, in fact, men do believe in it. I think the belief has three causes, two of which are irrational. Okay, so we do, this is an assumption that we do make about the world around us, that it is uniform, that it is predictable, that it has patterns that uh, can be assumed. Um, assumptions like this are, well, they may be impossible to live without because most of the, most of the time we don't have time or inclination uh, or perhaps capacity to look into every single aspect of life and buttress all of the assumptions we've made with real hard evidence. Most of the time we're left to make these assumptions and roll with them. Can you give me an example of what that looks like? Sure. Uh, we, we make assumptions about the, um, when, we're told, when we're told that the earth is some odd million miles away from the sun, we believe that. We don't really go look ourselves. We don't really go find out how to m take the measurements. You're saying we believe that 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 distance that, that uniformity exists. Well, in in the case of in the case that Lewis is bringing up, yes, we believe in the uniformity of nature without really much question. Um, the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. We um, we see a. Uh, a pattern to the seasons, a pattern to planting and sowing. When we put a seed in the ground, we expect the plant to come up out of the ground, especially if we know something about horticulture. If we're farmers, we definitely expect that. These are assumptions about the uniformity of 
natures, courses, and events that we all are kind of standing on without any good, without any, uh, maybe not all of us, but most of us stand on that without any sufficient evidence for, or sufficient reasons for it. You could say, well, all of our experience seems to back this up, but our experience is a very small slice of the history of the universe. We don't really, we don't really know that because something ha has happened 10 million times in the past, it will happen again tomorrow. We're not really certain of that. And if, if we really were probed with this, and Lewis is kind of asking us to probe it, that would become apparent. We don't really have good and sufficient reasons to believe that. He says that there are three reasons he thinks that men believe in this uniformity. And he says that two of them are irrational. In the first place, we are creatures of habit, he says. We expect new situations to resemble old ones. Now, this is obviously an irrational reason. We're creatures of habit. That's not rationality. That's just a habitual that's been built up in us. It is a tendency which we share with animals, he goes on. One can see it working often to very comic results in our dogs and cats. In the second place, the second reason... When we plan our actions, we have to leave out of account the theoretical possibility that nature might not behave as usual tomorrow, because we can do nothing about it. It is not worth bothering about because no action can be taken to meet it. And what we habitually put out of our minds, we soon forget. The picture of uniformity thus comes to dominate our minds without rival, and we believe it. Both these causes are irrational and would be just as effective in building up a false belief as in building up a true one. But I am convinced that there is a third cause. In science, said the late Sir Arthur Eddington, we sometimes have convictions which we cherish but cannot justify. We are influenced by some innate sense of the fitness of things. This may sound a perilously subjective and aesthetic criterion, but can one doubt that it is a principal source of our belief in uniformity? A universe in which the unprecedented and unpredictable events were at every moment flung into nature would not merely be inconvenient to us, it would be profoundly repugnant. We will not accept such a universe on any terms whatever. It is utterly detestable to us. It shocks our sense of the fitness of things. In advance of experience, in the teeth of many experiences, we are already enlisted on the side of uniformity. For, of course, science actually proceeds by concentrating not on the regularities of nature, but on her apparent irregularities. It is the apparent irregularity that prompts each new hypothesis. And this is an interesting point, because we, we don't want nature to be, to be chaotic. We don't want it to be so, so um, unpredictable that we can't live in it. We seek out a routinized and patterned nature because we seek out routine and pattern in our own lives. We need it to be patterned to some degree because otherwise we couldn't make predictions and advance forward into the future with some knowledge that what we're doing is right and will lead us to success. We need those patterns. They're there. Uh, we're, as Sir Arthur Eddington said, we're possessed by a sort of spirit of the fitness of things, a desire for the fitness of things. This looks like it fits. This looks like it has, it hang, it all hangs together. But and, isn't, isn't that what Hume is saying in the first place? That, that there is a uniformity about existence? He is saying that. He is saying that. And what Lewis is saying is, He's trying to answer the question, why do we think this in the first place? Why do we think that in nature is uniform? Lu Hume is basing his assumption about the uniformity of, the, of, of nature on experience. But experience cannot prove the uniformity of nature to us because there just isn't very much of it. Oh. Lewis is asking, before we go into why Hume is wrong, we have to ask, why is it that we all sort of lean on and rely on the fit the uniformity of nature on the fitness of things why is that he says he believes that there are three causes one of them is uh, is the the uh, when we go to make plans for things we we have to assume that nature will behave as we've thought that she does um, 
mostly because we can't do anything about it if she doesn't. If we uh, have a, a, a prediction that it won't rain on such and such a day and we schedule an event or a picnic that's outdoors and it ends up raining, well, there's nothing we can really do about that. That's one of the reasons. He says, and what we habitually do or what we habitually ignore, we eventually forget. We forget that nature can intervene with events that aren't predictable. So that's one reason. Um, the first reason, he says, is that um, um, we expect new situations to resemble old ones. We're creatures of habit, in other words. And um, that habit is, is uh, an irrational habit. It's, a it's an irrational reason, but it's one of the reasons nonetheless. The third reason, he says, is that we... Um, are possessed by a spirit of the fitness of things. We want things to fit. And because of this, we assume that they do, and we look for patterns to fit that framework that we've built up in our minds. Now, science is based on the idea that we do find that irregularity is repugnant. Because what does science do? And you can see this, you can see this with sort of how the... Um, how the idea and the uh, framing of the solar system and the orbits of the planets was was discovered and and um, and explored. When ancient astronomers looked up to the night sky, they tracked the course of the planets across the sky. Um, they, in fact, the word planet in Greek means wanderer because the stars were fixed. Well, at least they were more fixed. They barely moved. But the planets moved each night. The planet would be here one night, and the next night it was over here. These wanderers, they were trying to track and find out how they moved so that they could make predictions about them. And maybe this is just bare curiosity, um, or maybe it has to do with uh, the fact that those ancient astronomers were looking for ways to... Uh, uh, fixed times when the... the, the uh, feasts of the gods, the writs of the gods had to be performed. And the planets were, the planets and the stars are a way to measure time in that way. So they wanted to get it right. Well, because they assumed, or many assumed, that the earth was fixed and everything else was moving around it, they had to make things fit that pattern. In order to do this, they imagined the planets, uh, because of the way they moved through the sky, they imagined the planets going through what they called epicycles, right? So the planet would be moving. And then suddenly would stop, reverse on its own course, and then keep going on in this uh, in its original path. Um, now, planets appear to do this because the Earth is actually moving. But if you assume the Earth is still, if you assume assume that it is stationary, then you have to sort of try to uh, create a pattern for those planets that you observe in the sky to fit that. Over time, these epicycles became less and less accurate, and people had to create more and more complicated epicycles for these planets, the path that they were traveling, in order to make them fit what they were observing in the sky. Now, eventually, uh, astronomers realized this is not the case, the Earth is moving also, and that it's not the center of the solar system, that it's also orbiting the sun. But even that wasn't enough because it got them a lot closer and it simplified, it simplified those paths that the planets take through the sky, but it didn't get them uh, perfectly right. For one thing, they assumed that the planets were orbiting in perfect circles around the sun. This isn't true. They're orbiting in ellipses. They're, some of them are very, very slight ellipses, especially the Earth's, but they are ellipses nonetheless. And it's those little irregularities, it's those problems in the math that got them to go further and say, this model that we've built isn't enough. It's the irregularity that caused a problem, not the regularities. The regularities don't interest us. The patterns don't interest us. It's when something is off that we're interested. Mm. It draws us to say, why? Why is this off? Hypothesis, and let me go test it. That's what science is. What's off about this situation? This doesn't seem to fit a pattern. It doesn't seem to fit a model that we've built. The model needs to be expanded or maybe trashed altogether and a new one created. And that's what these minor 
irregularities in the path of the planets caused even later astronomers to focus on and, and ask deeper questions about and build a more complete and accurate model. This is what he's talking about. It's the irregularities that draw our attention. It is the apparent irregularity, Lewis goes on, that prompts each new hypothesis. It does so because we refuse to acquiesce in irregularities. We're not okay with them. We're not okay with irregularities. We never rest till we have formed and verified a hypothesis which enables us to say that they were not really irregularities at all. Nature, as it comes to us, looks at first like a mass of irregularities. The stove which lit all right yesterday won't light today. The water which was wholesome last year is poisonous this year. The whole mass of seemingly irregular experience could never have been turned into scientific knowledge at all unless from the very start we had brought to it a faith in uniformity which almost no number of disappointments can shake. So man in the past, you know, what you see passing in front of you is a stream of seemingly chaotic and irregular events. But man, for whatever reason, has a has a, uh, a faith in the regularity of nature, in the uniformity of nature, which seemingly no amount of, of, of uh, irregular events can shake. We believe that the universe is a uniform place. This faith, the preference, is it a thing we can trust? Lewis asks. Or is it only the way our minds happen to work? It is useless to say that it has hitherto always been confirmed by the event, that is no good unless you at least silently add, and therefore always will be. And you cannot add that unless you know already that our faith in uniformity is well grounded. And that is just what we are now asking. Does this sense of fitness of ours correspond to anything in external reality? The answer depends on the metaphysic one holds. If all that exists is nature, the great mindless interlocking event, if our own deepest convictions are merely the byproducts of an irrational process, then clearly there is not the slightest ground for supposing that our sense of fitness and our consequent faith in uniformity tell us anything about a reality external to ourselves. Our convictions are simply a fact about us, like the color of our hair. If naturalism is true, we have no reason to trust our conviction that nature is uniform. It can be trusted only if quite a different metaphysic is true. This is kind of touching on something that he we talked about at the very beginning of this book, the first few chapters. If nature is a wholly deterministic event, going back, I think, to chapter two or three, then we have no reason to believe in our ability to reason. We have no reason to believe in our ability to reason because the events taking place between our ears, these very special events we call thoughts, are just as predetermined as every other event. And so we cannot set them outside of the flow of nature, the predetermined uh, stream of events, and say, these are different. These thoughts are different. They are also predetermined. This is kind of in that same vein of thought. When we're asking about the feeling that we have about the fitness of nature, about the fitness of things, about the uniformity of nature, because obviously we don't have this because of experience. We have this merely as a sense or a feeling or a passion. Why do we have this? To answer that question, we have to ask, what kind of metaphysic do you hold? Metaphysic meaning, what system of beliefs do you hold above the natural ones, right? In other words, is it a God-kindled passion that we have that for the fitness of things? Is that where it comes from? Or is it a, a thing that or is our feeling about the fitness of things, our desire for it, just how we happen to work? That's really the same thing as asking way back at the beginning of the book, is nature a determined event? And if so, are the events happening in, in between our ears, these very special events we call thoughts, are they deterministic also? It's really the same question. So Lewis and says... What did, what did we say the first time that it was an impossible question to ask because in that moment to your reasoning, right? The question, yeah, well, what, well, are what, we living in a deterministic universe? Yeah. Well, what we've said is, what we've said is we have no way to 
get jump off our shadow. Uh, this is Lewis's uh, phrase here. We have no way to jump off of our shadow because by asking, we have to assume that the universe isn't deterministic in order to ask the question at all. Because when we ask the question, we're relying on our ability to reason. We're assuming that our thoughts can be true. We're assuming that our thoughts can be from the deterministic strain of events that have reached back to the beginning of the universe up to this moment and into the future. We're assuming that we can sort of step out of that stream and observe the stream, hmm. right? That's the question. That's why he says answering this question depends on the metaphysic that you hold. What kind of metaphysical philosophy do you hold? If naturalism is true, we have no reason to trust our conviction that nature is uniform, he says. It can be trusted only if quite a different metaphysic is true. If the deepest thing in reality, the fact, which is the source of all other facthood, is a thing in some degree like ourselves, if it is a rational spirit, and we derive our rational, rational spirituality from it, you'll notice it is capitalized there, then indeed our conviction can be trusted. Our repugnance to disorder is derived from nature's creator and ours. The disorderly world which we cannot endure to believe in is the disorderly world he would not have endured to create. Our conviction that the timetable will not be perpetually or meaninglessly altered is sound because we have, in a sense, eavesdropped in the master's common room. Now, he's saying that we can have a belief and we can have a solid faith in the uniformity of nature if, in fact, nature was created by a uniform creator. And we ourselves were created by that uniform creator. This is where we can derive that sense of that passion or desire for the fitness of things. We look at a chaotic universe as something that's repugnant because, and, uh, and hold that repugnance very close because it's derived from a creator that wouldn't create a chaotic universe. Our repugnance is his repugnance. He, is all, he also finds a universe that's completely chaotic, repugnant, and therefore did not create one. He created beings that don't, that bearing his image, don't like that repugnance or don't like that chaotic uh, sense either. They have a repugnance toward it as well. Okay, I'm sorry. And all this is an argument for what exactly? What is the why we have feel. uniformity in us? Uh, wanting and 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 defaulting you, to that well what is what you'll is remember the, earlier in the in this chapter just a few pages ago lewis asked in order to answer the question of um uh, in order to answer the question we're trying to answer in this chapter are miracles probable we have to ask why we feel why do we have this desire for a uniform nature why is that such a passion for human beings He's going into those reasons now. The three of them that we discussed earlier uh, that he yes. laid out, there's three reasons there. One was, the, and the one that's more rational, he said there were two that were irrational and one that's rational. The rational one is the desire for the fitness of things. There's a desire there for it, a passion for it. It's really the passion that underlies science, that undergirds science. Because when we find an irregularity, this causes us to go explore it rather than accepting it. Well, it's just a chaotic event. That's not something that any of us are willing to accept. We want to know why that fits. I see. Where does it fit? How does it fit? And once we find out, adjust our model accordingly. He, he says, our repugnance to disorder is derived from nature's, nature's creator and ours. The disorderly world which we cannot endure to believe in is the disorderly world he would not have endured to create. Our conviction that the timetable will not be perpetually or meaningly, meaninglessly altered is sound because we have, in a sense, eavesdropped in the master's common room, to go back to his metaphor from earlier. The sciences logically require a metaphysic of this sort. You can see why. Why do the sciences require a metaphysic of this sort? Because a metaphysic. A, 
a belief above all the other beliefs, a belief that ties beliefs together, right? It's a, why does science require a metaphysic like this, a belief like this? It requires a belief like this because if you didn't believe that you could get to the orderliness of nature, if you didn't assume that there was an order, if you didn't assume that there was an orderly, order, uh, orderliness to nature, that's a tough word to say for it some is, reason. Uh, I didn't want to try. <laughs> yeah. If you assume the orderliness of nature, well, you have to assume it in order to do science. Because what is science but a huge, towering assumption that the universe is a reasonable place, and we, if we devote enough thought and time and energy to it, can discover that orderliness. Mm -hmm. It's a huge, towering assumption of that thing. Science the universe is orderly, and science can discover the order. Because we are we are reasonable creatures. If we're again devoting, uh, if we're diligent enough, and we're determined enough, we are reasonable creatures, and we can discover those patterns. So science makes this base assumption that the universe is an orderly place. Now, Lewis says science requires a metaphysic of this sort. It requires this. If there were, if we didn't assume that the universe was orderly. And many civilizations have it. Not all civilizations have, have, have uh, believed that the universe is an orderly place. In fact, you can kind of see in any polytheistic system, you can see the need, the creation of the gods, the belief in the gods is almost a way to cover up for, we don't know what's going on here. There's a whole bunch of chaos. And so we'll attribute that chaos to some irrational beings that have lots of power. We'll sacrifice animals and pray, hoping that one of them answers us. Right, exactly. There's a whole lot of... The it, right, the that they will guarantee us some sort of security in the future, right? Yeah. This is, a, this is not a society that believes in the orderliness of nature. In fact, it sacrifices to the gods so that the crops will have a good year, so that the rains will come so that the harvest will be fruitful. This is a society that believes nature is chaotic and is using the polytheistic gods as a proxy for that chaos, as a stand-in for that chaos, giving it a name, giving it a personality, giving it really a, uh, an unapproachable, uh, undependable personality, because that's what the gods are. They're extremely capricious. They're all over the place. You never know from one minute to the next how they're going to feel, who they're going to favor, or why. He says the sciences logically require a metaphysic of this sort. Our greatest natural philosopher thinks it is also the metaphysics, the metaphysic out of which they originally grew. Professor Whitehead, Alfred North Whitehead is who he's quoting here, Professor Whitehead points out that centuries of belief in a god who combined the personal energy of Jehovah and the rationality of a Greek philosopher first produced that firm expectation of systematic order, which rendered possible the birth of modern science. Men became scientific because they expected law in nature, and they expected law in nature because they believed in a legislator. In most modern scientists, this belief has died. It will be interesting to see how long their confidence in uniformity survives it. Two significant developments have already appeared, the hypothesis of a lawless sub-nature and the surrender of the claim that science is true. We may be living nearer than we suppose to the end of the scientific age. Now, what's he mean by this, the, the uh, hypothesis of a lawless sub-nature? Well, this is the, the subatomic world that he briefly referenced, and I think in chapter 3, as a... As a uh, um, just, just to talk about it in terms of a way miracles could enter the universe through a sort of lawless subnature, but also the surrender that the idea of the science is true. Now, what is he talking about there? Who is he referring to? Well, the postmodernists probably. The postmodern uh, and and the pre-postmodern thought that really was questioning whether anything can be known. Right? Whether it's questioning whether anything can be known. And he says we may, in fact, be living nearer than we suppose to the end of the scientific age. Because in order for science to advance, it has to believe in the uniformity of nature. In other words, it has to believe that you and I, subjective beings though we are, can approach and lay our hands on truth. Now, that's a belief that you can't, it's very difficult to hold that belief without a metaphysic that says, 
we've got a legislator, capital L, that created all of this, created reasonable beings, created a reasonable universe, and is himself reasonable. He goes on to say, but if we admit God, we must, must we admit miracle? Indeed, indeed. You have no security against it. That is the bargain. Theology says to you, in effect, admit God and with him the risk of a few miracles, and I, in return, will ratify your faith in uniformity as regards the overwhelming majority of events. The philosophy which forbids you to make uniformity absolute is also the philosophy which offers you solid grounds for believing it to be general, to be almost absolute. The being who threatens nature's claim to omnipotence confirms her in her lawful occasions. Give us this hopworth of tar, and we will save the ship. Give us this little bit, this possibility of miracle, and we'll save it all. What's this, what is he, what's, what's the, give us this little bit, this admission that perhaps miracles can occur, and we'll also save science. We'll save the whole ship, because science depends on a faith in the uniformity of nature. And God says, you can have that. I'll guarantee you that. It's almost uniform, almost entirely, but not quite. Hmm. You get all of this. You get all of this, this assumption that, you've, you, that science is, uh, is, is pursuing something that's real, truth. You get that if you give me this. That's the bargain that's struck between us as humans and God as creator. He says the being who threatens nature's claim to omnipotence. Nature's not omnipotent, right? That's what Lewis is saying. It's not universal, completely universal. The being who threatens nature's claim to omnipotence confirms her in her lawful occasions. God says, I'll grant you this. I'll give you good reasons to believe that nature is a lawful place if you grant this one small piece to me. And the 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 metaphor is give us give us this hop worth of tar, this little bit of tar, so we can plug the hole in the ship and we'll save the whole ship. The alternative is really much worse, he says. Try to make nature absolute and you find that her uniformity is not even probable. By claiming too much, you get nothing. You get the deadlock, as in Hume. Theology offers you a working arrangement, which leaves the scientist free to continue his experiments and the Christian to continue his prayers. We have also, I suggest, found what we are looking for, a criterion whereby to judge the intrinsic probability of an alleged miracle. We must judge it by our innate sense of the fitness of things, that same sense of fitness which led us to anticipate that the universe would be orderly. I do not mean, of course, that we are to use this sense in deciding whether miracles in general are possible. We know that they are on, philosoph on philosophical grounds. Nor do I mean that a sense of fitness will do instead of close inquiry into the historical evidence. As I have repeatedly pointed out, the historical evidence cannot be estimated unless we have first estimated the intrinsic probability of the recorded event. If in giving such weight to the sense of fitness I were doing anything new, I should feel rather nervous. In reality, I am merely giving formal acknowledgement to a principle which is always used. Whatever men may say, no one really thinks that the Christian doctrine of the resurrection is exactly on the same level with some pious tittle-tattle about how Mother Egri Louise miraculously found her second best thimble by the aid of St. Anthony. <laughs> Something I've never even heard of. The religious and the irre irreligious are really quite agreed on the point. The whoop of delight with which the skeptic would unearth the story of the thimble and the, rosary, the rosy pudency with which the Christian would keep it in the background both tell the same tale. Christians don't want to talk about it, and atheists want to say, look, this is a stupid story about a, uh, someone who found a thimble with the aid of St. Who was it? Saint Anthony? Even those who think all stories of miracles absurd think some very much more absurd than others. Even those who believe them all, if anyone does, think that some require especially robust faith. The criterion which both parties are actually using is that of fitness. More than half the disbelief in miracles that exist is based on a sense of their unfitness, a conviction, due, as I have argued, to false philosophy, that they are unsuitable to the dignity of God or nature, or else to the indignity and insignificance of man. In the three following chapters, I will try to present the central miracles of the Christian faith in such a way as to exhibit their fitness, 
I shall not, however, proceed by formally setting out the conditions which fitness in the abstract ought to satisfy, and then dovetailing the miracles into that scheme. Our sense of fitness is too delicate and elusive a thing to submit to such a treatment. If I succeed, the fitness, and if I fail, the unfitness of these miracles will of itself become apparent while we study them. You can see that he's using the same, he's using the same criteria for whether miracles are a reliable, whether each miraculous story is a reliable story, as he uses for whether a scientific proposition is a, is a reliable proposition. Does it fit? Is the, is, the, is the orbit of Pluto off just a little bit? Does our model need to be adjusted just a little bit? That's what he's proposing. We use our innate sense of the fitness of things to ask whether or not a miracle is probable, improbable, or likely. Um, remind me, in the past, I, I can't remember if we've talked about or if I've read, science was birthed, at least one can make uh, the argument that science was birthed out of Christianity. Um, I, I can't recall if it was a well, Schaefer heard, you, book. Well, you heard that, that quote from Alfred North Whitehead in this chapter where he says that the a belief in a reasonable Jehovah and a mixed with the rigorous uh, criticism of a Greek philosopher is where North uh, Alfred North Whitehead believed science came from. And it is worth asking, why is it that science as a revolutionary way of approaching the universe, why is it that it only occurred in a certain part of the world? There's only a couple of options for that. And some of them we fought wars over to try to keep them from being something that's a prevalent idea. Racism being one. That this group of people in this certain area of the world was just better than everybody else. And we fought wars, rightfully so, to keep that from being the reason that we say this occurred in this part of the world. A better and a far more plausible explanation is that Christianity was prevalent in one part of the world far more than it was in any other. And that that belief system lends itself to, through people, and this is something laid out, you can see the seeds of it laid out in in uh, Origen, in, in uh, St. Origen, that is, and uh, um, St. Abelard, you can see that the belief that God is reasonable, that he created a reasonable universe, and that we are reasonable creatures bearing his image. All of this, despite the, despite the doctrinaire and restrictive view of the world that some people in the past have had in holding down science in the name of Christianity, all of this lends itself to an exploration of nature with an assumption that nature, once explored, will bear fruit. That that exploration will lead us to greater truths. And those truths, and this is something that really comes from the saints of the past, those truths will help us understand God better. If you're enjoying the content here at Just Conversations, please subscribe, share this video, and leave a like or a comment.